Welcome to part four of the introduction to Juniper series, which is all about routing. We're starting right here with the routing table. We often talk about the routing table like there's only one. The truth is there are several routing tables in Junos. The main routing table is for IPv4 unicast routes and is named inet.0. There is also a routing table for IPv6 unicast routes called inet6.0. On top of that, we can create our own IPv4 and IPv6 routing tables, which we'll see in detail in video 19. But it doesn't end there. There are several other routing tables built into each layer 3 Junos device. These are used for features like multicast, policy based forwarding, and MPLS. Those features are a little out of scope for this series. We can take a look at the INET0 routing table with Show Route. This gives us all the usual details you would expect from a routing table, except perhaps formatted a little differently. Over on the left, we have the network and its mask inside a notation. Next to that, we have the source that the route was learned from, along with a number called the route preference. In this case, the source is static, but this could also be OSPF, BGP, and so on. We'll talk about the route preference in the next video. Over on the right is the next hop IP address and the egress interface that is used to reach it. If that seems a little overwhelming, we can use show route terse. The A column is used to indicate if this route is active, that is, if this route is installed in the forwarding table. The V column is used with BGP. A question mark symbol here means that the route was not learned through BGP. The P column is the protocol code. This is how the route was learned, such as static, OSPF, or whatever. And of course, there's the next hop IP address. If we want to find which route will be used for a particular IP address, Use show route terse along with the IP we want to reach. Junos will show us the route that will be used. We've talked about the routing table being separate from the forwarding table. Valid routes go into the routing table and the best routes are selected for the forwarding table. That means that if we have two identical routes to the same destination, meaning that one is not better than the other, they will both go into the routing table. However, even though they may be the same, only one, selected at random, will be installed into the forwarding table. This is different to other vendors that actively use both routes in a process called ECMP, or Equal Cost Multipath Routing. At least that's the default behavior. We can define a policy that will allow ECMP. We'll look at route policies in video 18. In the forwarding table, we can see the destination network. We can see the next hop, which could be an IP address or a MAC address, there's the type, which will be something like unicast, broadcast, multicast, or local. And we can see the egress interface, which may be physical or it may be virtual. Further down the table, we can see layer two addresses listed as well. The forwarding table is not just for routes, as you can see. The important part to notice is the egress interface. This has given us the opportunity to really see the split between the routing table and the forwarding table. If you're not comfortable with this yet, I recommend reviewing this again until you're happy that it's making sense. Let's get back into the configuration now and create a static route of our own. This is done under the routing options hierarchy. I'm going to configure a default route. We set up the destination network first, then we add the next hop. It's that simple, nothing fancy. After that's committed, we can see this route in the routing table. When we test with ping, we can see that we have access to the internet. Static route configuration also allows for adding multiple next hops. Here's the config for the route that we looked at earlier. You can see the next hops in the list as shown with square brackets. If there's a problem with one of our routes, it may become a hidden route. This might happen, for example, if we've configured a routing policy to reject some routes that we've learned through a routing protocol. Hidden routes are still known by the router, but are not used. We can see a list of hidden routes, if we have any, with show route hidden. So if routes are not showing up in your routing table and you can't figure out why, check if they're listed as hidden. Now here's a neat trick. If you want to remove the static route from the routing table, we can deactivate it rather than deleting it. 
the route will still exist in configuration, but it will be listed as inactive. It won't appear in the routing table at all, not even as a hidden route. This is great for troubleshooting or as a temporary change, as we can quickly activate it again when we're ready. In fact, I'll reactivate it now. Now, we all know that the next hop IP for any route needs to be in a local subnet, right? Are you sure? This doesn't seem to be common knowledge, but it is possible to put a next hop IP in a remote subnet. This is not unique to Juniper, lots of vendors support this. In this config, I'm adding a route with a next hop of 10, 15, 8, 7. This is not in a subnet that's connected to my router. So it's not surprising that the route does not appear in the routing table, it's just invalid. Now I'm going to update my configuration to add the resolve keyword. Looking at the routing table now, we get a different result. The route is now valid, but it has a different next hop than the one we configured. We've configured a feature called next hop resolution. This is where Junos uses the routing table to find the next hop to get to 10, 15, 8, 7. Our route is then updated with the new next hop. This is something you might want to practice with in the lab. In past, you may have configured a null route. The example shown is for a Cisco IOS router. The two main uses for this type of config is to direct traffic into a black hole and to manually summarize routes. We can do the same thing in Junos, although the approach is different. In fact, there are two ways this can be done. The first is to configure a discard route. This is a regular static route, but with discard as the next hop. Any packets using this route will be silently dropped. The second way is to configure a reject route. This follows the same principle. The difference between them is the behavior when the packet is dropped. Junos will generate an ICMP error message and send it back to the source of the drop packet. When we look at the routing table, these routes simply show as reject or discard. We can't talk about routing tables without mentioning reverse path forwarding. This is a method of determining if a packet is valid or if perhaps it is coming from an attacker. This is the logic behind reverse path forwarding. One, a packet arrives at the router. Two, the router looks at the packet's source IP. And three, the router looks at the routing table to see if there is a valid route to that source IP. If there is a valid route, the packet will be forwarded as normal. If there is not a valid route, the packet will be dropped. The reasoning behind this is that there are some attacks that used forged IP addresses. If traffic is coming from an invalid source, then it has likely been forged. This is just one way in which we can improve our security posture. RPF operates in one of two modes, strict mode or loose mode. When operating in loose mode, the source IP of a packet must exist in the routing table. As long as the route is there, there is no problem and the packet is allowed. In strict mode, the source IP of the packet must be in the routing table and the packet must be received on the interface that's used in the route. Do you think strict mode sounds better? Sometimes it is, but it's definitely not in cases where you have asymmetric traffic. That's when traffic might leave on one interface but return on another. So if asymmetric traffic is normal in your environment, loose mode is better. If symmetric traffic is normal, strict mode is better. The quizzes are really getting more interesting now. I'm sure you'll agree. A lot of this is covered in more depth in the lab that goes along with this video which is available on the members section of the website. In particular, we get to see RPF in action. What happens if there's competing routes to go into the routing table? These are selected using the route preference, which you might know as administrative distance. Click the video shown here to learn about route preference, as well as qualified next hops.